I remember I wrote in my notebook on the very first day I was there that the Amazon warehouse had the atmosphere of what I thought a prison would feel like. Which sounds, you know, sounds like hyperbole, but it was, um, it, it was really like that. It was really, really actually like that. Today's guest, James Bloodworth, is an intrepid journalist who went undercover to work in an Amazon warehouse and expose the torrid conditions within. His acclaimed book, Hired, details his journey back into the working classes from which he came for six months, also working as an Uber driver and a care worker in impoverished parts of the UK for the book. You can get James's book, Hired, in all the usual places, including, of course, Amazon. We discuss what some may consider a double standard, but what I totally understand in the interview. Some of you who started tuning in after listening to my episodes with centre-right guests like Daniel Finkelstein or James Lindsay might be wary of the left-wing undertones of this episode. To assure you, this is not really a political podcast. I'm happy to talk to people on both sides and listen to their views, as long as they're liberal-minded and not dogmatic in their approach. James is quite an exceptional voice amongst the noise on both sides in that he focuses on the people having to do the worst jobs in the worst conditions rather than what many are doing by fixating on things like gender and race. He is merely pointing out something that the big companies like Amazon like to keep under wraps. When we buy something on their page, we don't think about the appalling conditions for the employees running around in a basement to find our product and ship it out. And respect to James for not just talking about an issue or virtue signalling like many others might do, but actually going in and working and living that life for six months. Because having read his wonderful book, it doesn't sound like something that I'd be up for. James writes often for the likes of The Times and The New Statesman. He's currently working on a new project about the dating scene. You can follow him on Twitter on at J underscore Bloodworth and on Instagram on at James dot Bloodworth. Get me on Andrew Gold underscore OK on both. And please do share this podcast with friends. We have a long 15 minute bonus interview that you can get on patreon.com slash Andrew Gold or by downloading the Patreon app. You can also now sign up on Apple just by subscribing to the bonus channel there. You get a three day free trial that way. By the way, there's been some confusion for Apple listeners. You can still find the free version of each episode. It's just a bit of a mess right now with the subscriber stuff all around it. Uh, I'm trying to sort that out. Next week should be famous linguist and social commentator John McWhorter. We'll be talking about woke culture and his book, Nine Nasty Words, about the origins of swear words. But now, here's James. How are you doing today? Where are you talking to me from? Whereabouts are you based? I'm in Bethnal Green. I'm I'm good. um, I came out from Somerset yesterday. I was visiting my grandmother... Um, nice. It was very hot. It was uh, it was nice, and I'm just uh, this morning's been a bit mad. I just had to file a column. I've been up since six doing that. Then I'll do this. Then I'll go gym, and then it's like that's it for today. How about you? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, all good. I'm, I'm moving to Somerset actually. We're, we're my girlfriend. We're based in Berlin, but we're moving to Bristol in a couple of months. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah, no, that's a good uh, good choice. Bristol's. Uh, I like Bristol. Yeah, it's, it was always. Um, I still enjoy going back there to visit whenever I can. Oh, nice. Yeah, I've never actually been there, but we just thought we want to move back uh, back to the UK and, and London is uh, utterly unaffordable. It's just, it's insane. So my parents aren't very happy because they'd want me to move there, but I, I don't even know how anyone does it. Yeah, now, Bristol is a good choice. Though. There's um, there's a lot, a lot going on there and it's, then you've got the countryside and it's a bit cheaper, yeah. <clears throat> well, hopefully that'll be nice. Um, your book is is brilliant. I've really enjoyed it. Um, so thank you for writing it. Um, did, I was thank wondering you. that did you, did you read uh, much Jack London? Have been, people must have said that. Have people been saying that? No, not many people do say it actually, which is, is was that, which is actually annoying because uh, he was one of the. So people say Orwell, and oh, like you, this is like a, you must have read lots of Orwell, and it's like yeah, I did right. growing up. But Jack London was was a bigger down and out in Paris. Yeah, Jack London's um, People of the Abyss was actually a bigger uh, influence in terms of doing this this project. That was um, and that inspired Orwell's books as well on you know his tramping and uh, uh, the road to Wigan Pier. It was Jack London's um, People of the Abyss, which was um, which inspired Orwell, and it and it and it really it did inspire me. I just I really liked it, although you couldn't do some of the things that he. Did like dress? I, I would have probably be, it would have probably been rather offensive if I dressed up in tr- and gone tramping. Yeah, in like rags. Um, 
Yeah. Like I already got some some crap for the book for like, oh, this is like poverty tourism, even though it's, I did those jobs before I went to college and stuff anyway. Um, but, but that would have been too far. You preempted that actually, didn't you? You, you confront it head on quite early in the book because I guess everybody who picks up that book is going to, and you, you must have been aware of that from the moment you started writing it, everyone's going to go, this is poverty tourism. So you actually, uh, I think you preempted that that reaction it didn't feel that way at all and i suppose if, if the alternative what is that just ignore it all then yeah i, I mean i was pr- reluctant to preempt it because i sort of thought you know why should people make these assumptions about me and my background and stuff simply because i'm a journalist then but then on the other hand i mean journalism is a profession which is does tend to be dominated by people from um mm. comfortable backgrounds i say um because the, the route into it is very hard you have to do these long internships often um, so yeah. I did preempt it because, um, yeah, it just to me it was just really unfair to, to say that, and it just distracted from the work itself. Um, I did all these yeah. jobs, and it was like me going back ten years later to do them again, but from a place where now I can actually tell the stories. Probably that's a good point that you raise because I think people get, uh, particularly in the media industry, journalism, as you say, podcasting. People worry about like the homogeneity of class and that kind of thing. And people are going, why is that? And I suppose most people who do journalism stuff probably had to work for free for the first two or three years. And you can't afford to do that, I guess, if you're from a working class background a lot of the time. You need you need some support usually. You grew up in a working class background, uh, would you say? Yeah, I mean, I did really. I, I grew up with my grandmother who was retired um, when when I was living with her. But, you know, her husband had, had died before I was born and it was, it was just us. And then my kind of step-grandfather, if you like, was a... A, a guy called Len from a, I mentioned him in the book he's from like a That's Welsh right. mining family and yeah we, we were for all intents and purposes like a working class family in a in a, sea, a fairly run down seaside town in in, in Somerset There's n- it's not a place of uh, of privilege and wealth um, put it that way and being far from London is a big makes a big difference as well because I remember one of my first jobs in journalism I had to just take anything just so I could move to London and pay rent whereas if you're in London already it, it, I think it makes it a bit easier to do some of the yeah. inter- free internships if you can live with your parents while you're doing them. Exactly. My first job was at the Watford Observer. Um, and mm-hmm. I was, I, no, well, I actually had to work for free for six months and then they offered me something like 12,000 a year, which ah. in London, wow. yeah. And even though I had the option to live with my mum, I just thought I can't bear this anymore. And I ended up working at The Sun. Because the Sun were offering pro rata for shift work, something like forty thousand or something. But uh, so, so compared to the, the, the Watford Observer, it was just a no brainer. But it was a shame because I, you want to work in that sort of yeah. grassroots journalism. Um, I mean, how did how did you start in in journalism? Um, so I, I guess like a lot of people like nowadays, a lot of graduates nowadays in journalism. I my route into it was kind of unusual in some ways. So I I, I did try to go through the local newspaper route. So I did. I went to university a bit late. Later, I went at 23, um, again, because in, I was the first one in my family to go to university. So it wasn't really on my radar that you could do that until I was in my early 20s when a friend went as a mature student. When That was when the university, you know, expanded a lot in the early 2000s and it became, you know, realistic. Oh, maybe I could actually go to university. Then after that, I did a master's in London for a year uh, in journalism itself. I went to university, did politics, did a master's in journalism. And then I did try to get a job on local papers around Somerset initially. And then I just ended up applying for everywhere. You know, I think I must have sent over 100 applications just uh, just expanding wider and wider from where I was. So I was basically applying all over the country just to get a job in journalism. And I didn't really get very far doing that. But then I did get a job for a b2b publication in london like a pharmacy subscription oh. pharmacy magazine which and i didn't know anything about pharmacy but it was a chance to you know they, they the main thing they wanted was someone who could could write and do journalism so that was where i started off and then i did some throughout i worked there for just over a year and during that time i you know i used my holidays i did work experience at the observer the independent right. and just I, I just basically worked my ass off that year used to write uh, on the on the weekends, I used to spend like Saturdays just writing, uh, pitching and writing stuff to like the independent it was at the time. Um, mm. And then like a year later, I got a job. Uh, I applied to be an assistant editor at the blog Left Foot Forward. And uh, the interview went really well. And then I got that. And that was a bit of a foot in the door into getting into more political journalism. Right. So even, yeah, I mean, in your story, there, there was quite a, a fair bit i guess of the work experience with the big names where you wouldn't have been getting paid 
Um, mm-hmm. Where do you stand on that? Because obviously there's the argument that, uh, you know, you should, that's not fair on anyone, but also how, how does a young person get that kind of experience otherwise? I think it depends. So so what I did is I, I didn't do more than, the most I did was a block of like two weeks at the Observer, I think. Um, and I was I was working at the time, I just took my holiday. We had like, a, you know, a month's holiday over the year from in the pharmacy publication job. And I just used my holiday for, I mean, it, I didn't like it at the time. I mean, it was quite annoying because uh, I didn't really like my job that much. And then I didn't have any holiday either. I had to go do work experience. Um, so, I mean, I don't think that's bad. I think it's it's bad when you have block people doing free work internships for like six months or a year. I mean, I think a week or two work experience, I think is really valuable. I think um, it was really val- valuable to me anyway. And it didn't really stop me doing other stuff and doing a full-time job. But but then you do have people, the people who, who really kind of progressed the most quickly from my journalism master's course at City mm-hmm. were the people who could do these blocks of six months to a year of free internship work at, at a newspaper or whatever. They were the ones who, who got the jobs immediately after university, whereas right. those of us who couldn't, um, we had to take a, a less direct route, should we say. It's an extraordinary leg up that I suppose is not, would you say it's not talked about enough? Because there's a lot of talk about inequalities and things. And it feels to me a little bit like it, the, the the ability of some people to do work experience and stuff for, for, for a long time and get a foot in is a huge advantage that's a little bit overlooked. Yeah, I mean, I feel like in some ways we do talk about it. But I think the problem is we don't know where to go next. It's like a lot of things in politics at the moment. We talk a lot about the the the, hi- the inequality around the housing market, say, and the fact that young people can't get on the housing ladder but there's also simultaneous simultaneously there's not really an appetite for any kind of radical reform which would change the status quo it's it's almost as if yeah and so we end up just talking about it with i mean with internships there's every so often it will be proposed that um the state should you know ban internships over a certain period of time and then you get this backlash and these far-fetched scenarios are put forward that oh well this could mean that um you know, it somehow, it somehow you know, damages the, the opportunities for poorer kids. And then it just ends up getting dropped. Mm. And it feels like we've been in this place for uh, at least the 10 years I've been in journalism. This thing comes up for a bit and then it disappears and nothing really happens. So mm. it feels like all we do is talk about it in some ways, um, yeah. just in, in spells and then it disappears again. What can you do? Because I, I guess, you know, you came from a working class background and you've got those opportunities, which I mean, The Guardian don't have the money to be paying that many people to give opportunities. So I guess there is an argument that if they didn't have those free internships, then a lot of working class people wouldn't get those opportunities. So what what is the answer? I think I think sometimes when they're well directed and when they're paid, you know, some we we had interns at Left Foot Forward and we paid them a uh, living wage, and then um, because I, initially I, I refused to basically take people unless we paid them uh, money to come in, and we paid travel expenses as well. Um, so I mean, you can do that and. I, I'd say personally, I'd say there's even a case for the state subsidising some of these um, placements. Um, I think there's. I don't see why why we couldn't do that. I mean, I, I'd ban some of the longer ones. Um, I think if someone's, I think minute just apply the minimum wage legis- legislation to like longer uh, internships. But then I think you could you could easily give everyone a month's uh, subsidised work experience somewhere, and then I think you'd have much more chance of the the best people. Um, getting the jobs rather than just the people with the most um you know the the most comfortable circumstances yeah i i know somebody uh, and i can't say who it is but he's got a company himself it's very small and he can't really afford to get people in so he basically he put up an advert to see if people would come and work for him and he was just amazed that like 600 people or something replied reply. so he just got them as interns he got people like um four people he got as interns to work for him it's just like a little business he does himself and then after um like a few months he realized they were going to have to go uh and the only way he could keep them was by giving them like a manager position but still unpaid and he got each of them four interns so he's ended up with like like a like thirty interns. That's how yeah. mad the situation is. Yeah, and I, and I think it's 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 bad because it it affects you know it, it means fewer jobs, fewer pay jobs. I think there's a, I think that it needs to be much more tightly regulated for a start because you you can't have a situation where paid jobs are just exchanged for interns. I mean we've seen that with with 
in a different way in, in kind of the gig economy where risk is offloaded onto employees because companies don't want to pay for certain certain worker entitlements. So they've reclassified, you know, what would tr- traditionally be workers' employees as these things, self-employed contractors, and then suddenly they're exempt from from being entitled to all these things that workers would have in the past. So I think that that's something that needs to be looked at in the economy generally, but but specifically with interns as well, definitely. So for those who are not yet familiar with your book, I've got lots of people listening who buy books. They're always getting in touch and saying uh, that they're getting the books and stuff. Would you be able to uh, just give me a brief description of, of Hired? So in early 2016, I, tra- I set out and traveled around Britain for six months, uh, working in low-wage jobs in different parts of the country. Um, and the idea of the book was to... I mean, at the time we were coming, we were still coming out of the 2008 recession. The idea of the book was to uh, look at the reality of, of working life for um, poorer working working class Britons today um, in different regions of the country, and also the, that was the initial aim. And then the book evolved into kind of a. I ended up staying in it, writing about these communities where it was as well. Um, so it, it's kind of um, not just an economic book. It's, it's also kind of a story of where Britain was in some ways in 2016. And it's quite just like we talked about Jack London, and, and I only read that Jack London book, um, People of the Abyss, which is quite um, quite <laughs> insulting actually as a, as a title. Um, I only read that quite recently because another writer I admire very much, Will Store, he talked about it as one of his favourite books. Um, so I, I gave that a go, and it's just incredible because he just, uh, as yours is as well, he goes into just you know southeast London, which was just so different to it today um, in many ways, anyway, and. You started with going into working in an Amazon warehouse, and it's horrific. It really is. It's horrific. So could you give us a little insight or the listeners a little insight into your time there? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, my first job writing hired or researching hired was in an Amazon warehouse in the town of Rugeley in the West Midlands. And I got the job there sort of by accident. So my my plan was in terms of the work was I I just started applying for various low paid jobs in different places. And the Amazon uh, job application was the first one that kind of came through for me. So um, the employment agency came back to me and invited me into the, to not really even an interview, just we had to fill out some forms. We had to be drug and alcohol tested, um, Mm. which was the first thing time I'd experienced that in any, um, in any kind of job and not at the hands of the police. Um, And then which I guess is fortunate for journalism because if journalists were drug and alcohol tested, they might be in <laughs> trouble. Um, yeah. Did they not? Did they not suspect? Did they? Could they you could have put your name into Google. Were you using a fake alias or something? No, I didn't. I mean, I was. I was way less. I was, I'm not sure if I'm well known now, but I was. I was way less, far less well known then before the book. And yeah, I mean, you could find me on Google, but there was so many. There was such a turnover empl- of employees at Amazon that. They just assumed I was uh, just another one. Um, mm. And I, again, because I'm from, I'd done those jobs in the past when I was younger. I kind of, I, I fit into that background. It's not, it's not kind of like George Orwell in the, in the spike, in the, in the spike with the tramps. And then he, he stands out as, as an upper class gentleman. It's, it's, I, I have tattoos. I fit in. I've worked in those environments before. Um, I don't have a cut glass accent. Yes, you didn't put your the Guardian on the CV or anything when you handed. No, it to- no, um, no. That's that's the one thing I did. So I took out um, sure. the journalism stuff from my CV and just kept in the the stuff I'd done when I was younger and it, uh, mm. fiddled with that a little bit. Yeah, so, which makes sense. It wouldn't have worked otherwise. They wouldn't. They couldn't. They wouldn't have taken. Yeah, it. no. I just wouldn't have got the job. And and yeah, then then I, then I I got the job. It, it was very easy to get the job. You just had to have your um, you know identification things like your passport or whatever and fill out be able to fill out a form and start on a particular date um mm. yeah and then i then i started thinking, and it was i was i was worried it was horrific i was i was worried it was going to be well my main concern with the book was so i had this deadline i had this book commission i had this deadline and i was kind of scared that how is this going to be how am i going to make this interesting because um look, how is it going to be interesting because i didn't just want to write like a dry economic book um dry economic like polemic but at the same time you know i have to be have to be truthful and and find interesting stuff and and seek that out but the amazon warehouse it kind of wrote itself because um far from being what i feared boring it was there was all kinds of stuff going on there and and it, it, it was just shocking from day one um i remember i wrote in my notebook on the very first day i was there that 
the Amazon warehouse had the atmosphere of what I thought a prison would feel like. Which sounds, you know, yeah. sounds like hyperbole, but it was, um, it, it was really like that. It was really, really actually like that. Yeah, so you were sort of running and how many miles was it a day that everyone was doing? 10, was it? Um, so it was between, we'd walk around between 10 and 15 miles each day, typically. Um, so we do, I did, you know, four days a week. Four, it was four days on, four days off, actually. Four days on, four days off. And um, uh, 10 and a half hour shifts throughout the day. And you'd walk between 10 and 15 miles a day. And the... Um, and yeah, you'd get you'd get kind of two ten minute breaks and then one supposedly half an hour break. But they would real in reality they'd be far less than that because the warehouse was a, was seven hundred thousand square feet. So there used to be these signs hanging everywhere saying um, that it was the size of ten football pitches. Amazon used to boast about the size of the warehouse. And so you had you know this one canteen at one end, and I was working on the top the fourth floor. So there's four floors of this warehouse, and you know the other you, if you're the other side of the warehouse, it takes you. 10 minutes to walk, almost almost 10 minutes from one, seven minutes, I say, from one side to the other. Then you have to go through airport-style security, empty your pockets, take your belt off. They go through your wallet as well. And that would take another kind of five minutes. It was it was literally like an airport. There's a queue and people putting things in trays and uh, all this stuff, um, taking your shoes off sometimes as well. And uh, then by the time you got to the canteen for a 30-minute break, you'd have like 15 minutes. For a 10-minute break, it's like you got like two minutes or something. So... It's pretty, it was fairly exhausting. And if you if you failed to keep up, you were given a point. There was like a point system, right? Yes. So there was a there was a disciplinary system which was based on a point system. So you had if you got six points, you lost your job, and uh, you would you would be given points for uh, various things. So you know if you if you signed in late, if you if you if you signed in if you clocked in late at the beginning of your shift, even just by thirty seconds, you'd you'd get a point. Um, if you took a day off sick, you'd get a point, even if you got a letter, even if you produced a letter from the doctor. So that to me was the worst thing in some ways, because, uh, so when I was, when I was a kid, I always used to get bad. I was a really bad asthmatic. So I, I missed like a month of schooling in, in one go because right. I have like in the winter, cause I just have horrendous asthma and, uh, it just then going into a workplace where if you could be sick and you go, you get your doctor's note, it's, it's all like above board and then they still punish you for it. And to the point where you can potentially lose your job, um, it just seemed very uh, unjust. And um, other points for things like like the, one of the coaches bringing Amazon workers broke down and everyone was 15 minutes late, but they also still got a point for it. Um, productivity, productivity targets. So if you if you miss those at all. Like if you were, if you were a bit slow or not even slow, but just you you weren't in the top whatever percentile other people, uh, you'd be threatened with a point. Um, all kinds of stuff. Taking too long in the toilet, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> taking too long, or even going to the toilet. You, they wouldn't like that. They didn't like that much at all anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and there'd, be, so there'd be this huge turnover of staff. Um, we were all employed on a temporary contract nine months anyway, and they, it was constantly drummed home to us that. I remember the, the supervisor said, be, un, be under no illusions, this is a temporary job, she said when we started. Right. And, uh, but, that, but it was like, it was it, pretty hard to keep a job for nine months anyway. Like I had, I had a few point, points by the time I left um, and I didn't really feel like I, I, was, I wasn't exactly up to any mischief. I was just sick one day. Um, oh my God. My feet were like bleeding, so I was a bit slower with the order picking, <sighs> which is the job I did. And because um, oh. they, yeah, they don't provide footwear. And so the first day you work, it's kind of tolerable. Then the second day you get, you have backache and then your feet are very incredibly sore by second and third day um, wow. to the point where you're bandaging, bandaging, bandaging them up because you're walking so far. It's like, yeah. you know, by the end of the week, you've worked, walked maybe like 40 miles and uh, you, you don't, you have cheap trainers on um, and yeah, the, the the results are as you might expect for your for your feet. Wow, it's horrific, really. And and I guess well, I, this audience to this podcast is is fairly varied because it's not really a political podcast. You know, it's often like you know I talk to a psychopath or something, and uh, <laughs> sometimes they're political people, and they might be someone uh, like you. I mean, in terms of this is quite a left wing book, of course, um, in many ways. And then you know, someone like Daniel Finkelstein has been on, so. Uh, the audience are very uh, mixed, and I think a lot might be 
uh, feeling a bit like they don't have much empathy for that kind of thing uh, because they, they might just feel, oh, this is more left-wing hogwash or whatever they might think. I think the thing uh, above all of that, that other stuff that really made me angry reading the book was how bad Amazon and other people uh, you've worked for as well, how bad they are actually just paying people. You know, so even if you think, well, that's a job, you're doing a job. Well, the fact is they weren't being paid. They're not paid properly. What's going on with that? And what, what excuse could Amazon have uh, to, to not pay what is a meager sum for them to, to people who need it by the end of the week? Yeah, ex- exactly. I mean, there's, so there was one young woman I interviewed um, who was paid uh, 62 pence an hour it worked out by the so 62p an hour by the employment agency um, which underpaid all of us when I was there as well um, and it took her six weeks to get the money back and then that was only because her mum was phoning up threatening to, oh. to take them to ACAS threatening to speak to ACAS um, and this was over Christmas as well so she was she had just no money basically over Christmas and she said you know if she didn't have her mum to help her she'd be basically on the streets. Um, I was paid below the minimum, minimum wage half the time I worked in the warehouse. It was, um, so yeah, my wages were like 50 pounds short one week. Um, I think it was something similar another week, and which is a lot if you're only on 250 pounds a week. It's like, yeah. that's like a big chunk of your budget just not coming through. And the agency just would be very dismissive when you ask like, oh, it's just like an error. You'll get it soon enough and just didn't really. They, they also refused to give us an employment contract because... And when I asked, you know, why can, you, can I have a copy of the employment contract? I asked, obviously, because I'm writing this book, so I wanted to see what was in it. They said, uh, uh, oh, we, there is no, the, the, I, he, it was like, there is no paper copy because you're on a zero hours contract. It, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's like a non sequitur. There's zero hours contract workers still have a contract, as I found out when I was a care worker later on in researching the book. But they, they essentially tried to, pull the wool over our eyes. The employment agency Transline, this was, um, that Amazon tasked with with looking after us. They they just wouldn't give us the, the document because we're well, based on this this lie that zero hours workers don't have physical contracts. Wow. So I mean even if, you know, among the listeners or whatever, even if you are a staunch capitalist and, you know, that's that's fine. The point I mean, Amazon don't play their part in how it's supposed to work because they're not paying their workers on time and they don't pay taxes. I mean how is that how is that allowed i feel angry i'm angry now i mean if you're if you're a capitalist surely you would want people to be you know receive a, a proper day's pay for a proper day's work i mean if you want to motivate people to actually work if you want to actually um do that then i don't i don't quite understand what benefit there is to capitalism of punishing people who happen to get sick one day um hmm. i thought we learned that as well i thought the so there was a period in the at least to some extent there was a period in the 90s and 2000s where there was a it felt like there was more of a understanding that if you treat employees properly you'll mm. get more in terms of productivity so we started to see you know gyms and and you know things like that facilities in workplaces where that, that cater to employee well-being as well because a happy employee is a more productive one typically but i mean that seemed that seems like a uh, a fruitful model of capitalism if you're a capitalist that, because you're going to get more from your staff but treating them just like dirt is um it doesn't even usually benefit the business i mean unless you treat them as completely disposable which is what amazon does but again i'm not sure what the benefit of that is to um other capitalists because as we've seen from amazon's dealings in the um in its online store and whatnot it's also hammering small business people with its um 15 to 20 percent commission i think i think it's 15 percent commission where it you know it takes this commission from its sellers and then copies their products and then sells cheaper versions itself driving its, its small sellers out of business so i'm so i mean if you're a capitalist i think you should also be worried about what amazon is doing i'm annoyed by it and yet uh i'm still using it all the time because it's just i don't know how else to buy things and i've got used to, i got used to buying things um and i'm sure you must have had a, a fair few hecklers on the right or the center who are saying hey but you know you're criticizing amazon your, your books on it what uh what do you say to those people i mean the yeah i've, I've definitely heard that uh, I, I think i heard that from someone at every, in 2018 19 when i was going around talking about the book a lot Mm. Uh, at events and festivals and stuff i always heard that from one person <laughs> um 
But I mean, the, 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 the most obvious answer to why my book's on Amazon is because I don't, as a writer, get a choice over that. It's um, the publisher chooses where it's sold. You know, I, yeah. I don't get to say um, <laughs> you can't sell it in Waterstones or you can't sell it on Amazon. That um, has literally nothing to do with, with me. Um, as a, I, I can't decide that. They wouldn't publish it if I said that because Amazon has essentially a monopoly over the uh, book distribution um, right. end of things at the moment. So it, it's... And, but, and that's not really my fault. I mean, I didn't really have a say in Amazon taking over the book trade and offering absurd discounts at a loss on its products. And Amazon has, has now, you know, dominant in the book trade. And I didn't really have a say in that. It's, I don't think it's any more fair to, to say that, as a, use that as a criticism than it is to, you know, hammer musicians and whatnot because of the fact that, you know, they have to use Spotify and YouTube, even though the rates not, might not be very good. It's, it's kind of, well, yeah, we've been forced into this corner. The, there is no alternative, really. Some people will be listening to this through Amazon podcasts, as both of us criticize Amazon. So, but what else can you do, you know? Um, when you were there at Amazon, one of the things, another thing that stood out to me was uh, the way the bosses were, who I guess were just sort of one step above the workers, um, and you described them as capricious. Um, what do, what did you learn? I think about humanity. Like, what? Who are these people that would treat people that way? Yeah. So there was kind of like petty furors, as the uh, I've heard heard them called before. So I mean, there's a there is a tendency when someone has you know just a bit of authority to kind of lord it over people just a bit you know beneath them. Um, that was certainly something I noticed at Amazon, and I think the, the whole culture of fear in the workplace made that you know exacerbated that. So. Uh, say you were say say you had kind of a hundred of us who were order pickers on the shop floor, and then you promoted say five of them. Um, those people were also constantly fearful of their jobs as well, and so in order to in order to kind of uh, gain credit perhaps with those above them, um, they you know uh, they would kind of wield you know a kind of uh, authoritarian authoritarian power over us as, as the people just below them to kind of impress their immediate superiors. It seemed like, you know, they were given these, these um, diktats in terms of what they had to achieve, out of what, what they had to squeeze out of us as workers in terms of productivity. And they were fearful if they didn't do that, that they would lose their jobs. I mean, that culture runs right through the, the company. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it was easy to hate them, but it was, it was also, it was easy to hate those people just above you, those those minor authority figures who would um, act in this very over-the-top uh, domineering way. But at the same time, they were doing that from a... They were being prodded by another group of supervisors just above them who were who were threatening them, essentially, with, with losing their jobs all the time. Sounds like a nightmare. Was it hard at times? I'm just trying to imagine myself, I were in that role. Uh, was there ever in you having to do this? Was there an ego thing of like when when you were getting flack from these people? Like, did you ever want to just say like, "Look, mate, I'm a I'm a published journalist. I've written loads of stuff. I, I fuck off," you know? Or did you, did you bite? <laughs> would you have said? Did you bite your tongue for the sake of the book? Um, I wasn't. I was. I didn't feel exactly like that. I did used to feel like the rage start welling up, but it was just. Uh, it was kind of like regardless of my own like real position if you like because i mean at the time i wasn't a particularly well-paid journalist i was just I'd, I'd left a job at left foot forward where i was editing the blog because i really wanted to write this book and i didn't really have a lot of money um so i mean i, I wasn't really i didn't really feel that coming and i had my, my book advance was like very small because it was the first book i didn't particularly feel um like i was necessarily in an economically superior position to those people who were, who were supervisors and managers at Amazon, I didn't really, like maybe I felt I had that kind of culture, that veneer of like cultural superiority, um, I guess, because um, I was, you know, someone I wouldn't treat people like that. And I, th I thought just, I, I felt like I saw through Amazon's kind of veneer of um, this great, you know, progressive company. But um, the rage was mainly just directed at the treatment. It was just, it just felt very, when you saw people being shouted at or when you saw these, these managers like raging at people for just some small mistake, it just felt on every level just like, profoundly unjust. I hate people so much. Um, <laughs> every, everyone's horrible when they get the chance, it seems. Um, you, you talk uh, or you write about uh, liberals sneering at democracy um, in one part of the book. Um, is I mean, we're in quite a complicated 
situation right now. And you you are, I guess, a left wing writer, but I feel like you have. Um, would it, would it be right to say you have some issues with the way other left wing writers are sort of taking on identity politics and things right now, and, and maybe leaving uh, the working class behind? So yeah, so so th- there's parts of the book where I kind of go off on a bit of a political tangent um, because it, uh, look, it was it was you know I did the reportage, I did the, did all that stuff, and then. I started to spend more time in these towns and I was where I was doing the work and speaking to people. And um, I think a lot of that stuff actually stands up well today because this was half of the book was written before the 2016 referendum. Most of it was written before Donald Trump was president. And um, there's been lots of stuff since then about, you know, uh, like people sneering at the left behind in these towns and working class towns and former industrial districts and how this helped to kind of cause brexit and the rise of trump and whatnot but you know i was writing that at the time before before all this commentary was so ubiquitous so i I think that some of that actually stands up quite well i think i was broadly right and and i think a lot of the stuff that's come out since um shows that but um like not that i'm I'm saying i I was right about everything at all like i I didn't think we that the country would vote for brexit for example but Mm. i think there's there was definitely a sense in there's definitely a sense in parts of the country, places where I was writing the book that those people didn't matter anymore. So there was a sense for New Labour, for example, uh, under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, that 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 working class had kind of exhausted its historical role. Like the Labour Party didn't need it, the economy didn't need them, um, and they could either just be given benefits to to live off incapacity benefits in places like South Wales, where People, people. It was it was a struggle to retrain people who'd worked in the pits, um, or just that you know they could be kind of palliated with like consumerism and out of town retail parks and uh, community things like community and 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 workers' rights and stuff didn't really matter because people no longer identified with their product their productive kind of side with their pro- they no longer, they no longer had a productive identity tied to work but their identity was tied to things like consumption so buying things and. Um, and whatnot, which was there was a period of time I think where liberal, the liberal left, the kind of centre left, thought that was all people needed. But I think recent years we've seen that that's not really true. I think people long for something deeper, whether it's a sense, of, so that sense of community, for example, a sense of democracy, a sense that they have control over what's happening in their local area, whether that's in terms of um, migration to the area, whether that's in terms of what happens to the high street, and they're just there's. There's less democracy in, in many of these places than there was in the past. There are no trade unions. There's, the social clubs have gone. The pubs are closing. Everything's being taken over by these huge chains. Chains. Small businesses are being driven to the wall. Shops are boarded up. And I think the the revolt, if you like, around the populism and Brexit and Trump and whatever, like to some extent, I think it's a way of... I don't know if I can swear on this podcast. Please do. Please do. But it's, it's just a way of saying, like, fuck you to... to to people who they feel uh, like to lord it over them, um, whether that's on the left or right, whether that's Brussels, whether that's Westminster, whether that's Jeff Bezos and all these like globe trotters flying around on their private jets and stuff, and while their yeah. towns just go to shit, I think that's part of what this populist revolt has been about. Like that uh, hillbilly elegy book um, in the states, which was a lot about um, uh, why people mm-hmm. voted Trump, um, and. and yeah, I, I I think about friends of mine who are mostly middle class and went to good universities um, and have great educations and and all these kinds of things. And they're often on Twitter and they're often posting, you know, very socially active and socially aware. And it's a lot of stuff that's very important about uh, equality, uh, racial equality and uh, other kinds. And then they'll sort of share a photo of a, a, a council estate with loads of England flags because they're getting ready for the football and they'll be very sneering about those people and, and make assumptions about racism. Uh, or oh, they must be a bunch of racists. And I, I just thought like, how, you know, where's the empathy? Because these are real people who, as you've pointed out in the book, when you don't earn much money, there's not much you can do. And you've got your football game going on. And I don't know. I mean, I, I got, I really enjoyed those, the parts of your book where it was only little, you know, flashes where I think you made reference to that. Is that, is that, is that a fair an analysis that I'm making? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, how is that Emily Thornbury these days? Um, cause she was, uh, she did 
did that post a few years ago, yeah, which um, it appeared to be sneering at someone with an England flag uh, draped over there, over their balcony. Um, I think the, the to me, what's happened with with politics on the left, in particular, in the last, I suppose, since the Thatcher Revolution, since the seventies, eighties, and then it, it basically accelerated in the nineties and two thousands. Is there's no longer a belief really in uh, well, there kind of is a bit more again now, funnily enough, but there's, there was the belief in kind of the egalitarian socialist society kind of faded away with the end of the social democratic settlement with the fall of the Berlin Wall. There's there were fewer and fewer, fewer people who really believed that you could achieve this egalitarian society economically, where we where we kind of um, the, the means of production are in the hands of ordinary workers and uh, etc. So the compromise instead was to accept you know, significant levels of financial inequality. So as Peter Mandelson famously said, you know, we don't mind people getting filthy rich as long as they pay their taxes. Um, but you, as long, but then the, the, the impetus was to make sure that the, the capitalist meritocracy was, so everyone could, could, you know, it, it was equality of opportunity. So you have a boardroom where, and representation. So you can have a Goldman Sachs board, boardroom where people in the boardroom earn a thousand times more than the people on the shop floor just as long as you have 50% gender split, you have 12% ethnic minorities and then two trans board employees or whatever. That's like that's where the left has been, the liberal left anyway, for the last decades. And while I think you know that's an improvement on a society that isn't representative, firstly, it's not the same thing as democracy. So you can sit, you could we could otherwise we could simply appoint the House of Commons on the basis of representation, you know, different regions, different ethnicities, different genders, different sexualities, etc. But that's not democracy. It's something very different. But also it's it's still profoundly unsatisfying for those who find themselves in the in the on the shop floor earning not much money. Uh, with the trade unions or, or, or bodies that once represented them, you know, destroyed and unable to have a secure environment community to bring their family up in because they don't have any economic security. That sense of community has disappeared from those places, and it creates resentment. And you have people in these places, whether it be South Wales, whether it be the West Midlands, whether it be the Northeast, who are who were, I think, in 2016, looking for someone to blame for this and someone to follow. And then the people they sometimes followed were the people who came in and said, you know, point with a very straightforward target, you know, this is who is to blame: Brussels, uh, Westminster, Washington. Uh, whatever, and then it was it was compounded by the fact that you have middle class and liberals who many just have this natural kind of class bound animosity to, towards working class people. And I I I, I recognise I feel like I recognise this as someone who came from a working class background. You can I sense it sometimes from people. You just you just see you just notice it, um, and that and we and we sense it. That's what I mean. Is it's so there was a very good book um, called Fulfillment by. An American journalist, I forget his name. I I, I wrote about it recently um, on on the Amazon, like Amazon and the United States and the the Rust Belt, and he made the point that you know people know when when people like Hillary Clinton talk about deplorables, you know, re- refer to Trump supporters as deplorables. Yeah, you know, that that's true of some of them. <laughs> that's true of some of them, as we saw with the storming of the the Capitol building. But at the same time, they know that these like Washington liberal elites are sneering at them. It's, it's so like we know basically as, as working class people, we, we can, we can smell it. It's uh, it's obvious. And that, that compounds the issue of, of populism. It's so, it's so insidious. I find it when it, when it does come from the liberal left, because the whole point of the liberal left was uh, to, to build working class communities up and not to sneer down at them. Yeah, well, I mean, that was the that was the goal of the socialist left and social democratic left, which is slightly different. I mean, the hmm. the that politics has become much more professionalized on both left and right, <clears throat> and I think now you have a, a cadre of of political politicians and thinkers and academics and wonks, as um, <clears throat> they're sometimes called, on the left, who their background is bourgeois liberal, um, if that's not too old fashioned a phrase. Um, it's kind of bourgeois liberal, and their 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 economic interests don't align with working class people anymore. So they're is very they're very content to focus on these. I wouldn't say superficial because I don't think it's superficial to want to you know reduce racism or or sexism in society. But these kind of 
these that, these very limited attempts to kind of reform society where it is all about just getting the boardrooms to be representative and stuff and what happens further down isn't really so much on their radar i think there's lots of people who are in the liberal professional political space who are quite comfortable with that because it suits them in terms of their economic you know reality and and whatnot i'm a total lay person with politics right but but then that probably means that i think quite similarly to a lot of the voters right and it does seem a little bit if the working class have moved towards the to- the Tories, it's because you know they want to they want to hear about uh, growth and whatever. They don't want to be hearing about um, very important topics, but trans activism and BLM and Israel and Palestine. I mean, th- these are worlds that are so far away from most people, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's um, I think especially because the issue around some of those things is there really is an element of virtue signaling to it. So you, you can get on with improving the economic prospects of uh, young black men in London, say. who So young black, black men in London from the Caribbean have some of the poorest prospects in terms of their economic prospects in, in, in Britain, but also in terms of, say, uh, having run-ins with the police, so being stopped by the police and harassed by the police sometimes, and, and et cetera, and they come from economically deprived families very often. You can you can address those issues with out necessarily virtue signaling. So I think there's there's a there's a big economic chunk to that. There's a big economic chunk to simply helping poorer people because and then sweeping those people up in that. So you improve their life chances as well. There's institutional reforms um, you can you can get on with quietly get on with. Um, but I think the a lot of these debates have kind of sunk into this virtue signaling and this kind of test of people's moral worth. So, that, you know, their moral correctness. So it's become more important to post a, a black square on Instagram than it has to actually uh, engage in politics and work out how we create a society where people aren't discriminated against based on skin colour. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of sunk into this morass of, like, identity politics, where it's it's about displaying your identity as as this kind of, person who believes in Black Lives Matter or this activist who believes in these things rather than actually affecting real change, which is, it's like the consumerization of politics almost, where it's mm-hmm. like you have your political brand, you brand a shit about on social media, you put it on your Tinder profile, <laughs> um, yeah. which, which is happening, which is a thing now as well. But then you, you don't really actually do much to bring about the change. There's not the, the level of community organizing, there's not the level of um, grassroots like struggle and and uh, solidarity and organisation that you had say with the trade union movement or something which which to be fair had a poor record on supporting migrant and women's struggles very often um, but there's there's the like collective organising model has kind of faded and we have this very individualistic approach where so say like very briefly say like the issue of racism where it's become more important to kind of denounce someone for their past transgressions so maybe they made some stupid statements racist statements say 10 years ago like that cricketer on yes. 10 years ago on social media or something which you know that's bad um but it's it's, it's as if the, the main thing has just become pointing out the heretics the people who are wrong and then casting them out of the community of the good rather than actually looking at the structures in society looking at the the reforms we can bring in that would give you know young ethnic minority kids a much fairer crack of the whip, as, as they say, and, and to get on in society, to, to do well for themselves and to be able to bring up families without being harassed by gangs or harassed by the police. It's, it's like, that's the issue. But it's become about almost this, it's taken on this really, almost pseudo-religious guise where it's all about rooting out the heretics and the bad people and you have to be morally pure and you've never had any of these uh, bad thoughts about about other people. And that, to me, that's a complete side issue. I mean, I... I care what happens to. I think what happens to society as a whole is more important than whether someone harbors some dark thoughts or something. Yeah, I think we don't. I think as a society, most of us don't like people who, who proclaim to be perfect and have never had those kinds of thoughts. I think I don't know about you. I, I I've, if I meet somebody who's very honest about God, I'm a bit of a this and a, you know, and they're honest and open, and then you feel like, well, that's human, that's real. Mm-hmm. And I wonder. We've been skirting around the word woke because nobody likes to use the word woke on both sides everyone's you know so but that but that's in some ways what we're talking about it, it's come along at a time when i suppose religion's been on a decline and it maybe it serves this need to be like i'm a 
I feel like a righteous person and I have my God or my beliefs. And, and as you say, heresy has become this big thing. Yeah, I mean, the, like religion, like organized, traditional organized religion has, has faded, but the religious impulse hasn't. Um, yeah. I think people, people want to believe in something, in like a struggle that's bigger than themselves. But there's also just the, the framing of arguments in terms of one's moral uh, rectitude um, instead of, so, so as you say, so it's become about elevating these perfectly moral human beings who are supposedly above any kind of prejudice or animosity to anyone else, which, which is impossible, which is why these people are always, the people who elevate themselves as kind of moral paragon, paragons of virtue are, are often the ones who get completely uh, destroyed by the media several years later because, firstly, because such people don't exist. And secondly, because this kind of posture of that pure purity is often a cover for, for much worse things. I mean, it's, it's, that is something that's consistent throughout history. The purgers get purged always. They get, you know, I, we, maybe in this spirit, we should talk about what the worst thing is that we each ever did. I can't think what mine is. <laughs> what, what's the worst thing you ever did? Like to myself or <laughs> to myself? Does it have to be like bad to another person or just like stupidest thing? I think the morally, the, most morally, obviously we don't read. Really, I mean, that's a ridiculous thing for you to have. To, what's mine? Uh, yeah, no, it's unbroadcastable. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not that bad. It's, it's things like, it's more just, it's more, to me, it's more hurtful, I suppose, when it's something I've done to someone I cared about. So um, I remember like, on my 18th birthday, um, my gran gave me some money. It was just before my 18th birthday. My gran gave me some money to buy some shoes. And so I bought the like cheapest shoes in the shop, told her they were like 50 pounds. And then spent the rest of the money on like cigarettes and I think weed or something. And yeah, my grandmother, my 18th birthday was spent with my grandmother crying and say, say like, oh, like just, it was just, it was just, it was worse because it was like someone I cared about. So why was she crying? Because she discovered the lie or because the shoes were more expensive than she expected? <laughs> she, yeah, no, she, she was, she wasn't crying at my taste in shoes. It was, uh, <laughs> she was cry, crying because she found the receipt of the actual shoes. Oh, and then no. I'd lie to her. They were more expensive than they actually were. And so she was just like really, she was really upset that I'd lied to her basically, as was I. And it was just, uh, yeah, that was, that to me, that's the one thing that really sticks out in my mind of when I've done something something else. I mean, I've done loads of stupid things in terms of mm. just harmful to myself, but um, that was something that where I felt like it really hurt someone. Yeah, by doing something that was obviously wrong. I could tell that stuck with you. And yeah, like imagine if that now you had to be punished forever for a thing you did when you were 18. It, the whole thing is so unfair. I'm yeah. Trying to think, I think about in terms of how my, I mean, just thinking, trying to think of my own one because it's unfair to just have you. I can't think of what, there were about a million, but I just write, it's just because I, th I should have thought about this before, but I didn't know we were going to talk about that. But I, I, I often think back to like, I shared this meme that I thought was really, because I was getting into this, like I thought I was this sort of socially active, socially aware person. Um, a few years ago. And do you remember there was a meme going around saying that uh, it, was, it was a pro-immigration meme and it was, it was um, if somebody can come over here and they don't even speak your language and they don't have qualifications and... I do remember this. Yeah, they take your job, uh, then you're obviously not very good at your job or something like that. And I remember sharing that and because I was, you know, look at me, I put, you know, my colours to the, whatever the expression is, what is it, my flag to the mast? What's the... Putting my colors, colors to the, nailed your cut your colors to the mast. Is that right? That's it. <laughs> I nailed my colors to the mast of like, look at me. I'm a liberal and I'm very I'm very empathetic and so I can understand that sort of the feel why people do that. I felt great about myself. You know, I felt like I'm such a hero. I'm so pro immigration and I'm not a bad person without even considering what that means for people who do have to work those kinds of jobs that I wouldn't last a minute in the kind of jobs you're describing in your book. Um, and it, that's something I, I massively regret. That kind—that's my thing. Mm -hmm. I've, I, yeah, I do remember that, and I've—I've I've again had that impulse as well. I mean, I was—I was once a postman in Nottingham while I was a student up there, and I used to, every Saturday I used to have to deliver to these deliver mail to these, uh, and also during the holidays to these very rough like estates basically. And in the summer, I do I do it all summer as well. And then I remember. Uh, one day, it's like a Wednesday, I think. We used to, it used to be the day when people's like benefit uh, letters would come through, so then they could go take it to the post office and uh, get some money. And I remember there was one instance where I used to see this guy who would be at the end of his garden at like nine or ten in the morning with a can of like special brew 
every Wednesday waiting for the, and he'd keep on badgering me when I was walking up the other side of the road, like, oh, have you got my gyro, etc. And other times he'd be ranting about migrants and stuff. And and I, I a part of me was like, like, I mean, this guy is like moaning about, complaining about people who are working their asses off, who come from, you know, Poland or whatever. At the time it was Poland. Working their asses off to, to make a better life for their families while he's basically just uh, wasting his life drinking special brew sponging off of uh, sponging off of the taxes they pay and it's and there is you know i resented that but it, i think where it's wrong is when you project that onto everyone from a certain background it's like this kind of collectivist collectivist thinking where because you know one person you don't like is from this group or one or some people you don't like are from this group therefore it's you know oh we have it turns into a political prejudice and mm. you you just that as long as you don't do that and make these simplistic sweeping judgments i think it's it's okay to like dislike people I think even this bloke you're talking about, obviously you had a personal connection with him and he was driving you mad. But like, <laughs> for me, I've come from, you know, a middle class, you know, nothing in, it's crazy or anything, but en- enough to be comfortable. So who am I? I, d- I don't have a, a clue what this guy's life must be like. Yeah, and, I mean, that, to yeah. a point, I agree, yeah. I think, I think no, I think that, that's a really good point. And it's, um, I think that's a maturity thing as well. So I feel more like what you've said, because this was when I was like 24 yeah, then at twenty five, and I feel much more like that now. So reflect more, yeah. understand the complexity of it. I had a scientist on here, Doctor Stuart Faramond, uh, who, who's brilliant. He, he does a book, you know, uh, how to live the perfect day, and he's a scientist, and it's all uh, different things about how much you should sleep and so on. And he talked about how the brain doesn't stop growing until you're twenty five. So even if you try, and, I mean, and also Daniel Finkelstein talked a lot about. Um, the, the Vietnam War, we always think about it as like the young people were so against war, but actually there were just as many young people who were vehemently pro-war, uh, really up for it, because young people tend to just, you know, be that way. And uh, as patronizing as it sounds, and I do patronize my little sister because she's 14 and I try and tell her stuff like this and she just doesn't want to hear it because she believes in horoscopes and I'm trying to make her not... Oh, that's know. come back. That's really come back recently. <laughs> it has. It's she got really wound up on, uh, at me and for, it's the first time we've, because she's obviously 14, we don't have like debates and arguments but we were on the phone and she hung up the phone on me. So... <laughs> that's you told. Yeah, yeah, I know. I was just saying like, okay, but why, you know, and she was saying, well, the planets and such and such and I was like, oh, okay, but, <laughs> you know, fine. But, but yeah, e- e- even if... You know, it's pointless me really doing that with her because her brain's not going to continue, you know, finish even finish growing until she's about 25, 26. <laughs> yeah, it's, horoscope stuff's come back as well because I've noticed it. Um, it's, it seems to come in cycles. So when I was younger, in well, yeah, it does. The nineties, it was horoscope. still, uh, yeah, that was <laughs> that was inadvertent. Um, so yeah, in the in in the like nineties and stuff, I remember as a kid, it was seen as ridiculous. It was being seen as ridiculous to believe that, and then. Uh, it's, then that was the case for many years and then now it feels like it's it's come back I mean <laughs> having been single for a bit on a, a number of dates for the, in the last you know since since I got back in London at the beginning of the year um, I've heard quite a lot of times you know what's your sign the question what's your sign um, mm. and it's I have, have to kind of repress annoyance <laughs> of that <laughs> If I want the date to go well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but do you, at that point, is part of you sort of going, I still want the date to go well because, you know, short-term projections and also it's awkward if it doesn't. <laughs> but long-term, this isn't just not... You can't... Ha- can you have... I'd, <laughs> if this was one of those shows where, you know, write in if you're, you know, are you a couple and one person believes strongly in horoscopes and some people don't, I, I think it would just be difficult. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, I don't care enough to get into the... to get into some aggressive argument with someone about it. Like, I'm not... Like, I'm quite clubbable on a lot of things. Uh, I'm not particularly bothered if someone uh, thinks differently from me about stuff like that. It would probably... I, I'm also, I guess solipsistic enough to think that by dint of hanging out with me enough they would just those silly ideas would kind of they'd shed them uh over time i think you've done another inadvertent pun with solipsistic meaning the sun goes around you with the horoscopes oh yes i have sorry i had five hours sleep last night so these will will perhaps (laughs) creep in no but if you'd done that on purpose it would have been imagine that if that you and and by and i should mention actually i i and i don't how do you how do you compliment somebody's writing without sounding patronizing. I don't know how you do that. So, And I, I always struggle with it, actually, when I'm or with people, because most people have written books. And I, I want to, I hate saying your book was great because it sounds 
uh, sh- not true. It sounds hollow because it sounds, it sounds like you know. Of course, I had to say that, but you you are particularly good. I really like a lot of your similes and metaphors and use of alliteration. And I, I made a point of that. Uh, I, I wrote that somewhere. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I made some made some bad ones as well in the in the book. I mean, when did I write it? Five years ago. Five years ago, and some of them are. Uh, uh, I, like a few a few uh, mixed metaphors are in there, <laughs> which is um, I hadn't been writing that long at the time though, really. Um, now I need to write another book because I feel like I'm much better now. But yeah, but you always feel that way, don't you? As a writer, you look back, even if you're like yeah. a, a kid at school, you look back at what you did a year ago, and you're like, oh, who was that? That that's rubbish. And then, uh, sometimes you're unfairly harsh on the old you. Yeah, that's true. It was just I was taking a note, and it was you said the working class go in and out of fashion like the cheap contents of a catalogue collection, and I liked that because obviously it's a nice metaphor and simile, and it has really good alliteration of the contents of a catalogue collection. It makes the book uh, more interesting to read. Yeah, I mean the whole the whole thing. I, just to make a quick point about that, I mean the whole thing with the book was to begin with was I wanted to write about the economy in Britain at the end of 2015. At the time, David Cameron was prime minister, and he was he was saying all this stuff about you know Britain's on the road to recovery after this long recession, and there was a boom in jobs and 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 whatnot, and. I wanted to write this book about the reality of life on the zero hours contracts and, and etc. But I didn't. But then the danger of that is that it's a very dry book. And for one thing, I have ADHD, so I wouldn't be able to sit and concentrate on it. I just get completely bored with it. Mm. So I wanted to write it like almost like a novel in some ways, where I'm the character, and then I mm. take the middle class reader through this world in the same way that someone like Jack London did with the People of the Abyss, where you take people who hopefully the reader can empathise with me. Um, the way it's written because it's supposed to be very um, uh, very straightforward they can empathise with me they believe me as a kind of narrator they trust me as a narrator and then I try to make it I wouldn't say colourful but at least um, so you're reading it and you get a real sense of the place where I am whether it's the Amazon warehouse or working um, as a carer whether you really kind of um, so it's kind of rubbing it in people's faces a bit. And that involved using um, some descriptive language and similes and, and metaphors and things like that. Um, so it wasn't just this dry kind of um, uh, economic tome. Yeah. When you said rubbing it in faces, I'm reminded of the part about... That isn't a metaphor for rubbing like uh, bodily fluids in people's faces as a care worker because yeah. we did see lots of those. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. And there was, there was a bit about... Um, like someone's in- intestines coming out of their bottom uh, and you have to sort of uh, pop it back in. Yeah, I mean, I don't know why I'm laughing. No, well, you've got to sometimes, don't you? You have to in that, in that yeah. situation, yeah. Yeah, the, I mean, the care work, yeah, was um, that was the hardest, hardest work, in, in my opinion, just because of things like that you had to deal with. Fucking hell. I, you know, I think what you're saying is spot on about the book and the way you wrote it because I always look up, you know, on Goodreads and stuff, I look up all the reviews and it's got very, very good reviews. And even the people, and this, I want to make this clear because people, like I say, people listening will be from different sides of the political spectrum and stuff. And and even people who who clearly were uh, maybe centre or centre-right and they didn't agree with some of the left-wing stuff, they really enjoyed the book. It was You were like a character and it was fascinating for them. And they were, I mean, I think one person wasn't happy and said, oh, I don't want any mention about Thatcher. I'm tired mm-hmm. of hearing about Thatcher. But and it was very, you know, and it, it, it's about the story and it's, uh, you know, I was engrossed, uh, like just like Jack London and all that. It really was. There's, there's not that much politics in it anyway, I didn't think. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's, there's, I'm not really an ideologue. Uh, I'm first and foremost definitely a journalist, a writer. That's how I think of myself. That's how I identify. I'm not bothered about going against people, like going against the mainstream left if I I disagree with someone. I really don't care. That's why I did this job because you you get the freedom. Well, to some extent, in a book, you definitely get the freedom to do it, to to go against the kind of the current. But um, there are parts, yeah, my instinct is on the left. Like that's where my inclination is. And there Mm. are parts where that comes out in the book, but I don't think there's, there's not too much of it in there. It's it's mostly... um, just reportage and, and stuff from and writings on the places I am and, and just very straightforward descriptive stuff. Yeah, yes, I would agree with that. And it never feels like lecturing. So it, it's good. The last last question, actually, I, I wanted to just, just ask, um, and it's because it's for selfish reasons, because I'm writing a book about the science of secrets and keeping a secret and living double lives and that kind of thing, like what happens to a person. Um, you were doing that, I suppose, in many respects. Some some people, I suppose, you told you were a journalist, and some people you didn't. I mean, did, how did that did that play on your mind at all while while working uh, while do while doing the research for the book? Yeah, I mean, it's quite it's quite a strain 
throughout the process. It's like, there's like a tension the whole time. Um, I that, that's the, the thing I find hardest about doing it in a way. So you, that you have to maintain that like dual personality in a way where you're at work, you're at, you're in this place, and you're one person. Then you go home and you revert to your real self in a way, and then you sit down at the desk and uh, transcribe the notes and things like that. And it's it's almost a relief. It's like coming up for air when you get home um, because it is it is attention. It's, it's like acting in a way. Yeah. You have to put on this front all day. And it, that's quite tiring in itself. Um, and also, yeah, you meet people you like. Uh, so I met people I worked with who I who I liked, and it, it does feel like in some ways you're betraying them, even though you're not. Because I remember there was people I worked with who I got on well with, but it, but just being because there's that level of dishonesty about who you are, it feels like you're betraying them uh, in a way. Even though, in my opinion, the greater kind of good, if you like, is the fact that I'm exposing the situation there and and, and writing, telling that their story. Because I have, I'm privileged and privileged enough to do this writing job where I can do that and, and tell people about what's going on in these places. So yeah, I mean that was offset. That was offset. That kind of sense of cognitive dissonance, dishonesty. That was offset by, to me, as I saw the stuff that was unfolding in the Amazon warehouse, let's say, or, or the care work I was doing, or uh, as an Uber driver, I became. Quite, rad, quite, quite evangelical about telling the story. So, like, I, so I, I really felt I started off the book feeling like I'm, I'm worried this is going to be boring, and I have to kind of write in this more. I have to write in this very engaging way so that people stay with the subject matter. But then I ended my research with the book very kind of proselytizing in terms of what I'd seen. So, so you know, people, I, I have to tell people what I've seen in these places because it's. People don't know this is going on. So um, that kind of, to me, that justified this level of kind of um, acting, this facade I was putting on in the workplaces. And, and again, I interviewed some of the, I did tell some of those people I was interacting with what I was doing when I trusted them. And then I would sit down outside of work hours and interview them. And I think there's, there is, there's ethical question Like you have to think about the ethical side while you're doing it, but it's not, um, there is a, you can you can absolutely do do something like that ethically. You just um, you just have to like you can only be dishonest about what you're doing to to a point. It's the crux of of what journalism is a lot of the time, uh, and, and it's it's something I've had to sort of deal with myself. You know, when I'm interviewing people who who I'm getting along with very well, and then you're going to have to put something out that's going to make them look bad, mm-hmm. um, which you weren't doing with with most of these people anyway. But it's just the you have to remember it though. Yeah, they, yeah, like you have to be. Yeah, I, I, I'm doing some work now. Well, I was before COVID, um, and will be carrying on again soon. Where, yeah, I'm, I'm spending time with people I, I like in many ways, um, and I'm, I wouldn't say I have to betray them, but it's yeah, they may not like the result of what comes out, but you have to be willing to prepare to. You have to be prepared to accept that as a journalist. Do you want to talk about what you're working? On? I could put it in the podcast or at the moment, or as anything. Yeah, although it's it's so it's in such early stages really that um i'm just looking at some of the subcultures that have come out of uh dating apps and and the weird the weird 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 subcultures that have come out of like dating apps it's completely different in some ways but there's some there's a similar style of reporting to some of it though oh uh, yeah. i would like that that's right up my street so yeah it's, it's pretty pretty yeah. it's more like weird in in many ways <laughs> Yeah, I love that. That's that's you know, I I read that's I would love that. I would love I so so yeah, I'll I'll be following you on Twitter and everywhere where you am, but you know, I'll be paying attention for when something like that comes out and hopefully get you on again sometime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I, I need to crack on with it now. <laughs> really to to get to get it out. Thank you, James, for being on the show. It was a pleasure to have you or him on to talk about his or your fantastic book, Hired, which you can get in all the usual places. Link in the show notes. Whisper it quietly, but you can get it on Amazon. I feel like I learned a lot from James. He's a fascinating guy, and I hope to have him on to discuss any future projects because his upcoming work about the dating scene sounds great to me. Follow him on Twitter on J underscore Bloodworth, 
and on Instagram on james.bloodworth. You'll get me on andrewgold underscore OK. Uh, please do share this around with friends and get our 15 minute Patreon chat by signing up to patreon.com slash andrewgold, getting the Patreon app, or just signing up to the bonus side on Apple. Thank you so much to this week's newest patron, uh, Timothy Bira from France. He signed up to the top tier for a year, which is fantastic and a huge help and support to the show. Looking forward to getting him into our monthly Zoom chats. So thank you so much, Timothy. Je mérite pas ton soutien, mais je t'en remercie. C'est vraiment gentil. Speaking of languages, next week is famous linguist and anti-woke scholar John McWhorter whose book, Nine Nasty Words, we'll be talking about. It's amazing, incredible to look back at the ways we started swearing. Please share the podcast with friends. I've noticed a few of you have started doing so and letting me know. I love that. Thank you. And do leave reviews on Apple or CastBox. This week's newest review came from I Am Not A Monster in the US, who wrote, Engaging and Informative. Even when the topic seems mundane, I nevertheless find myself enthralled by so many of these episodes. Thank you for that, I am not a monster, and I'm sorry I didn't read out the following sentence, which was rather bawdy and lustful, but nevertheless appreciated. That's all for this week. Hope it made you all happy, or at least happy you're not working in an Amazon warehouse. Unless you are, although you probably wouldn't have time to listen to this, to be honest, uh, so you're probably not. See you next time.